All right, so we continue. Got through bleaches. I should start making a list of what things are. So you realize there's only a few things in your life. So laundry, detergent is very close to shampoo. Some hand soaps, but they're not really soaps, they're more detergents. All the different cleaners. Then you have your waxes that are going to come a whole lot, but for so now, I have a fabric softener. And then also I have waxes are hair conditioner. And let's see. Now what was lie? NaOH. We'll talk about that. Drain cleaners. So nothing but NaOH, or they could be potassium hydroxide, KOH. The drain might be clogged up with grease, which is fat. So, as you know now, turns grease into soap. It gets hot, so now you have lye as a drain cleaner. And it's very dangerous. With that in mind, you also have oven cleaners. And they have lots of dangerous warnings. Sadly, it might be like an aerosol spray. That's the scariest thing because it's sodium hydroxide being sprayed as a gas. So, or being sprayed as a, part, uh, a bit of an aerosol, I would say. So, N-A-O-H in spray form. Why would you spray N-A-O-H drain cleaner directly on the walls of your oven? Because the walls of your oven have grease and it turns it into soap. Now you have oven cleaners. There's only like six things in my house, I always feel. Now, you have hand dish soap. But it's not a dish soap, it's a detergent. Like Dawn. Works as a surfactant, surrounds it, makes it myself. Dawn cut grease actually surrounds it, they said. So, laundry detergent, shampoo, hand soaps, dish soap. And you often hear, what happens if you put dish soap into your dishwasher? All you do is make a bunch of foam and it's a horrible thing to do. So, then you have dishwasher detergent. And I'm going to put detergent in quotes. What are you asking your dishwasher to do? Well, if you have your hand soap and you're in the sink, you have to scrub it to get the stuff off of your, but not too much scrubbing. The soap is working. Okay, but you might have like a little bit of a scour on the outside of a sponge. You want your dishwasher to just wash everything off of your dishes without being scrubbed. It's nearly impossible. You're asking too much of the device. So this isn't a detergent. This is sodium hydroxide, once again. So now, if you've got grease or food, you're putting concentrated base drain cleaner directly. That's why I hate this kind of stuff in some respects. So now you have 
dish washer detergent. I shouldn't even call that. But they all fall under the sodium hydroxide. What I think is the most dangerous thing is they make these pads or these little pockets to make them very pretty, these little uh, pouches. And it's bad enough if the child gets some laundry detergent as a pouch and eats it. God forbid the child gets dishwasher detergent as a pouch and eats it. So your house has some really dangerous chemicals. You would burn your kid's throat out. You probably have so many operations to be the most horrible thing. Okay, so please be careful with the household chemicals. But understand, there's only like three things so far that we've been talking about this entire time. We use them all the time for different things. Hold on, let's see. I'm erasing. We're just trying to go through your house so you're an informed citizen and know what stuff is. You know? With that in mind, I'll leave this up because knowing me, I'll just keep adding to it. So now, some people have organic solvents. In the older days, if you do, uh, if you go to a great grandparent's house, or if you go to an estate sale, there'll be a metal cabinet in the garage. So when you open it, you really get knocked down with some of the most illegal pesticides and some crazy solvents because we did all kinds of stuff. We actually did all kinds of chemistry around our house to try to fix stuff. So organic solvent, we all had paint thinner. But to speak about paint, there's oil based. And then there's water based. So the paint thinner was a solvent to work with the oil based one. The water based paint, of course, didn't use it. You use water based paints in your house inside, but rain will dissolve it. You have to use oil based paint outside. Now, a lot of you are like, well, who paints their house? We all painted our house. Every couple of years, we painted our houses. Before siding, before rock face, all that kind of stuff, you painted your house. You would put new tar paper on your roof every couple of years. My dad's roof probably had like 18 layers, no, 12 layers of tar paper that I would hammer down. We had this long chicken coop that I grew up in in South Jersey. And I would just roll this stuff out and hammer it down. And after a while, I started to leak, I rolled another one. Really, really heavy. It was really rough on the roof. But you painted your house constantly. So when you paint the outside of your house, it wouldn't just rot away because your house was made of wood and it would rot away. You would paint it with oil based paint because if you paint with a water based paint, that'd be bad. Now, if you want to paint and make a beautiful, like nobody seems to paint their houses inside anymore, it's challenging, okay? But if you want to make like an oil based paint, some enamel or something, so you make a dining room that's absolutely beautiful with crown molding, that kind of stuff. You have to open all the windows if you're going to use an oil-based paint inside because it's a solvent and it's going to like dissolve into your lungs which is a real issue right there anyway what does paint have well let's see paint has a solvent could be water or it could be like turpentine or some organic solvent some petroleum distillate something from saudi arabian oil it would have a binder so that it sticks to whatever you want to paint. And then it has a pigment. And this used to be white PBCO3, lead carbonate, extremely sweet molecule. It's ridiculous. I weighed out powdered lead carbonate. And honestly, when I weigh it out on a scale, in like if you open up a, a fake sugar packet that has like uh, saccharin or something in there and you rip it inside the Denny's at 4 a.m. and you rip it, you taste it in your mouth, it, aerosol, it, it became an aerosol and you taste it. Well, I was weighing out some lead carbon and I said, oh my God, that stuff's incredibly sweet. It causes a form of mental, I don't want to say retardation because it's a word we're not really supposed to use, but it definitely causes brain issues for young children and that's why kids would chew on their cribs because they taste so darn good okay so they stopped using white lead carbonate and they went 
to ti TiO2 titanium four oxide. They would call it titanium dioxide, but uh, so anyway, we got that one out of the way. There's your paints, stuff in your house. Got this one done. Let's do some more stuff with waxes. Okay. For natural waxes, you've got your beeswax. You got your duck wax. If you ever eat duck, it's one of the fattiest birds in the world. Um, water does not stick on a duck's back, as you know. You got beeswax, but then you got sheep wax. I had sheep as a child, and you try to shear sheep, and boy, you have the wrong scissor. Your hands get extremely uh, lotiony, all right, because it has so much wax, uh, this sheep wax. Well, that's called lanolin. It's actually pretty expensive. Whenever I'd have the students make um, lotions and creams uh, in the laboratory, we could never get rid of the smell of sheep, it, but it's really expensive stuff. So now, uh, let's see, for my waxes, I now have fabric softener, hair conditioner. I guess I can add to it all your lotions and creams, which means I'm moving into cosmetics. So let me add that because people do want to know what their cosmetics are. And hopefully you don't have to test them on animals anymore. Horrific things that did the poor rabbit's eyes for cosmetics. Okay, cosmetics. There's a definition for them. Food and Drug Administration. USDA. Articles designed to be rubbed, sprinkled, poured. This is how codes and federal regulation are written. They want to make sure they can go to court with you doing anything. So rubbed or sprinkled or poured CFR 22 or something or sprayed for the purpose of personal attractiveness. They actually have a definition for everything the government does. Well, that's your definition. History. 7,000 years ago. It was a very amazing civilization that we didn't understand until we were able to read the hieroglyphics because of the Rosetta Stone and look it up. But um, the Egyptians, they had a very long history and they're very isolated people. So if you think about it, how much desert there was around there. But uh, it's pretty amazing stuff what they did 7,000 years ago. What did they have? They used, now SB is antimony. Antimony and copper ore ground up as eyeshadow. Made you look probably pretty amazing. And then by 3,500 years ago, people in Egypt bathed. I'm not sure it's bathed, but either way, um, in scented oils. If you ever think of what essential oils are, if you do holistic medicine, you can get grapeseed oil, you could get almond oil, you can smell like all kinds of stuff. You'll have bees coming after you, but it's probably going to make your skin feel pretty good. Um, so they actually were almost like washing in these oils. All right, let's see what else. The Greeks invented cold cream. And that means nothing to anyone anymore. 
But people used to take cold cream, put it on their faces to remove their makeup, if you're wondering, okay? So, by the 18th century, white lead carbonate was rubbed into your face. <laughs> if you ever saw um, the French, when I talked about the fact that, um, well, you know, they smelled really badly because they weren't, uh, not because they were any particular reason, except for they didn't shower, lots of bacteria. People had snuff, they would breathe in snuff so they could shut down their olfactory senses. But oddly enough, they looked amazing and strange because they had this white powder. They what rubbed white lead carbonate into their faces and their wigs. But remember, this causes a form of mental slowing people down stuff. I don't want to say mental retardation, but it causes definitely, so it's absolutely crazy. The Romans had lead pipes. We talk about lead in Flint, Michigan, and how a little bit of water could have some lead in it. They rubbed lead carbonate into their faces. But uh, they wanted to look a certain way. Anyway, lead poisoning was bad. Many died from lead poisoning. Well, if you're gonna rub it directly into your skin, you gotta wonder what's wrong with you. So, got your USDA definition here. What's a drug in the first place? Food and Drug Administration, right? What can be tested on animals? What should be tested on animals? Well, nothing should be tested on animals, but what has to be tested as a drug and what doesn't? Let's talk about that. Here's a good example. Antiperspirants. ANTS versus deodorants. Okay, where are we going to be with antiperspirants versus deodorants? I need to find that exact slide. Here it is. This is a germicide and perfume. You kill bacteria, bacteria makes smell and perfume. So this is not really a drug. This right here, antiperspirant, this is a germicide perfume and it often had aluminum or zirconium and there's a long discussion about that for Alzheimer's and I'm not sure where that ever ended up but this was a drug that constricts sweat glands. Now, I'm not sure that's a good idea. If at the end of the day, your germicide is no longer working and you have some smell, your body is trying to sweat. If you tell the one, number one place you normally sweat underneath your arm, if you totally, just imagine if you put like glue over it so that it couldn't sweat, what you're doing here, your body's gonna sweat somewhere else, okay? So um, I'm not so sure it's great to like tell your body not to sweat. So let's put it that way. But people, some people, you know, you really do need certain things and they can't uh, stand, how much they sweat. So I get the concept of how people did that. Now let's talk about your skin. And there's a lot of words for this I use in my other class, but I'm not gonna use in this class uh, or hold them to in the other class. Skin has an outer dead layer and a lower a live layer. An outer dead layer and a lower alive layer. The outer layer has, well, the chemicals here, keratin. So it has like proteins. I'll tell you why that matters, but it has like keratin and has like some proteins. A lot of times we can take 
from animals, lanolin, and something from animals from that like we took from sheep animals, protein and elastomers, and we rub it into our dead layer of skin, and we kind of hope that it doesn't get wrinkly. So we're actually taking a piece of the animal saying, this is an elastomer from the animal. Geez, I hope it works on me too. I'm not so sure it's the best idea. Here's the whole thing about this. You have to protect the lower layer because the lower layer will become the outer layer at some point. A good example, in the 1940s, the Hollywood stars didn't go out in the sun very much, or they had these big hats. And all the way into their 80s, their skin looked pretty good. In the 1960s, people were like, I love the sun. Now forget about the cancer, they were killing the lower layers of their skin. So they looked incredibly wrinkled later on in life. So that's an issue, right? So protect the lower layer. So less sun and don't smoke because that constricts blood vessels that feeds the lower layer. So the sun can kill the lower layer. By the time you get older, you look older before your time. And in the same respect, if you smoke too much, you can definitely see people who smoke too much because they've killed their lower layer and they have much more wrinkles than their twin sisters who, or brothers, or significant others who are related to them. All right, so moving on with our skin here. We've got the antiperspirant done. We're doing chemicals in your house if you're curious. Trying to keep your attention span here. Now, for the outer layer, ten percent moisture is good. Above ten percent micro organisms grow. So you could have acne. Now, this is so subjective, just like I talked about with drugs. You've got to become an expert on your skin as well. Your skin treatment is not going to work with anybody else's, okay? If you go to the West, where I remember when I went to Montana, I told my mother about the miracle of bread, because I'm not talking about that stuff you get in Walgreens that never goes bad because they put something in there like those hostess things and you're like, wow, this just never goes bad and you're wondering when you throw it away. If you buy fresh break bed here in the Midwest and you leave it out for a couple days or inside of a bag, you're going to get um, a lot of mold on it and you got to throw it out and give it to the birds hopefully, right? So if you take bread in Montana, there's not enough moisture in the air. It just all becomes hard, hard and you have no mold anywhere. So you treat your skin differently if you go to Montana or the West than you do if you're in New Orleans. You have to match your skin regime with uh, what's going on from, from where your particular environmental and your body's conditions are. You might be an oily skinned person or a non-oily skinned person. So above 10% microorganisms grow below skin or below 10% skin flakes off. So out there you might want a humidifier for your house. If you live in New Orleans you want might de you might want a dehumidifier. You have to just become an expert in your own body and how you actually live, how much nutrients you can take, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's never going to be the same for everybody else. All right, so now I mentioned lotions and creams. Lanolin makes a stable emulsion with water. I know you're probably not saying, okay, sheep oil, why does it make a stable emulsion with water? It takes a lot of whipping, but it does. What is an emulsion? If you have oil and vinegar, and you're going to put it on your salad, and you shake it up, and when you're done, you put it down, it's going to separate. 
if you took Dawn dishwashing liquid, which is a bridge molecule, which you would hopefully never do, and put it into your oil and vinegar and shook it, you make an emulsion that will not separate because the bridge molecules hold the two together. Well, lanolin can make an emulsion with water. So now, lotion is tiny droplets of oil suspended in water. And creams are tiny droplets of water suspended in oil. You know the difference. If you go to a store and you want to get some hydrocortisone cream, it's a delivery system to get 1% steroid on your skin, okay? You could get the lotion and rub it on your skin, or you can get the ointment or cream, which is ridiculously heavy stuff. I want you to know the difference of the two. It's just the percentage of water. So lotion is going to be mostly water with a little bit of oil suspended, and creams are going to be mostly oil with a little bit of water suspended. Okay, with that in mind, so you have moisturizers, which I would think are pretty much just lotions. They hold moisture on skin for you. You know, it's not just your face. You really need to, like, manage your entire body and, and use that oil everywhere. I mean, you don't want to, like, ruin a big hunk of your back or something when you're only, like, treating what you think people can see on, on the phone or on a computer. All right. Now, still working with skin, we have UV light triggers the production of melanin. So does vitamin D in fish oil. So if you take cod liver oil, your skin looks a little bit better. You could also get the same, um, or a little, a little darker, uh, you can get the same effect from the sun, but it's dangerous. You're killing your lower layer of skin, and later on you might pay for that. So people often want sunblock. And this gets kind of silly, but sunblock. has a skin protective factor. SPF. And it goes from 2 to 48. I don't know this right now. You could look it up. But I bet you once you get about 10 or something, you're probably doing all the same stuff. I don't know where the actual number stops. Um, it takes 48 times longer to get as much sun as if you didn't have the skin protective factor. At some point, it's going to look like um, uh, just like uh, paste over your skin. Uh, just try to avoid direct skin uh, sunlight on your skin, and you might be better off. Moving forward, now we're still doing some cosmetics. Your lips have no natural oil. Well, I guess because they're almost inside your mouth and they have to dissolve food. Uh, once they get inside your mouth, your body does. So it has to be a little bit different. So no natural oil. So it's like heavy, or so I would say lipstick, is like heavy skin cream with wax. So they'll probably take some lanolin-based system, sheep wax, and then add some beeswax to it, if you're wondering. 
So it's more waxy. Of course, you don't think about that. You probably think of lip balm. Or maybe you think about lipstick. I don't know. Eye makeup. You're no longer the Egyptians. You're no longer just rubbing ground metals into your skin like antimony. So let's see what eye makeup is. Carbon and metals. So the carbon and the metals are still going to give you the colors. Okay. Carbon and the metals with fat, oil, wax, maybe soap mixed in. So you are kind of doing what the Egyptians are doing, except for now you are taking the ground up uh, ore of antimony and you're mixing it with some fat before you put it on your skin. We're not that much more evolved. Then there's eye shadow. Which is all of the above for eye makeup. So this stuff, eye makeup here, let's call that mascara. So mascara, I'm not good at eye makeup. Mascara is carbon metals with fat oil wax, maybe some soap mixed in. Eyeshadow is all of the above with TiO2 from paint. You know, you have to like cover up old paint with a, a foundation paint, uh, and that has a lot of TiO2 in it. You can't just paint blue paint on top of red paint and not expect to have an issue. You have to put something over it if you start painting your house. Well, anyway, that TiO2 that they use in paint to be the brightener, you add it to eyeshadow, it gets brighter. Oh. What is this stuff, if you think about it? If you ever think of a Petri dish, what is a Petri dish to grow bacteria? It's some kind of a fatty gel that they can live on. This stuff looks like material from a petri dish. So throw out eye makeup after AFTER three months because. It's as if you were trying to grow the strep bacteria on a petri dish. Well, if you look at what you got, you got like bacteria in the air and plus on your skin and you're rubbing it against your eye makeup and that stuff grows there and it's warm at a wet environment. So you can give yourself a heck of an eye infection from this. You never know where you get your eye infections from. You wear contacts, you get eye infections from constantly touching your eye probably. Okay, I'm gonna want to erase here. We're doing well on time. You're happy. Everything's going well. I'm not going to keep you late. Don't worry. Like, how many more things are in my house anyway? Well, we got to go toothpaste. What is that? Toothpaste is soap, but it's really just detergent. It's got to be that same sodium lauryl sulfate. It's got to be that same, a little bit of that laundry detergent type stuff, but detergent, but it's called, you know, in the form of something they might call soap, but it's more of a detergent, plus grit, which is ground up limestone. You have to scrub your teeth, but you don't want it to be so much that it takes off the enamel. Okay, you don't want to hurt your teeth that way. What else does it have in there? Well, it might have some fluoride. It should have fluoride unless it's completely organic and you have this issue with fluoride. And fluoride's amazing, makes the only thing actually doing anything aside from the cleaning to get rid of the bacteria. That's why you need to floss. 
uh, the fluoride makes teeth probably time probably thousands of times less soluble to soda acid. Now it's a weird thing to say soda acid, but if you drink Coca-Cola religiously, like it's a religion or something, that stuff will dissolve your teeth away. So you better be not be like also an organic person. Well, you could be, you could be anything you want. An organic person is like, and I am not gonna have fluoride too. You wanna make your teeth less soluble so that you can drink your soda. And then you can actually feel your teeth get kind of furry if you got too much of that stuff. Ah, let's see. We talked about perfumes already, which were esters. That was another chapter. Perfumes are esters. So those are all the pretty smells of grapes and everything else. So now I think I want to leave you with some hair stuff. Not much so. So this hair stuff I find interesting. Your hair. If you're a man, you play a lot less to get your hair cut, which is crazy because I have ridiculous hair and uh, I get to get it cut and uh, they don't charge me half as much as they charge my wife, uh, which is kind of sad, but that's just the way it is. So they often push certain looks that are expensive so that you'll say, I want that look. And I don't think they think men fall for it or something because they don't seem to push any particular look on men. All right, but on women, they used to push perms. So I want to talk about perms. Women stopped doing perms. Perms can make your hair straight if it's curly or make your hair curly if it's straight. I'm going to tell you why, well, don't worry. But when they stopped, and I guess for some reason, women were like, no, I'm not going to. It could be men. Okay. They were like, no, I'm not going to perm my hair. They started putting in all the magazines, wild colors. And what's that? Sit for a long time with aluminum on different strands. They'll do anything to get you to do some long $150 treatment to your hair. And if you give up on one, they'll invent another one. So, um, okay, just for a while there, you're like, you know, can I just have like the same hair price cutting hair for as a man? And they're like, no. Well, it's up to you what you want to do with your hair. But let's talk about your hair. Your hair has a certain amino acid that has a disulfide bridge. Okay, why do I care? Cysteine or some amino acid. It has a disulfide bridge. Now, H2S or any C S S S H smells like rotten eggs. Can't drink about it. The sulfur smell. Smells like rotten eggs. Comes from volcanoes. Volcanoes are bright and red and hot. So we had thought hell smelled like sulfur for a long time. It's a very primitive thing that comes from our history. So um, hell has a bad smell. Oftentimes Dante's Inferno. But Anything with an S to an H smells like rotten eggs. Your hair doesn't have an S to an H. It has a sulfur to a sulfur to a carbon to a carbon. It's doing fine. Now, you want a perm. You either want to straighten your hair or you want to do the opposite of curling your hair. So you add a chemical to break the S to S bond to S dash H dash H dash S. So this is step one. But once you, and the chemical, you can smell the bottle. The metal does not smell bad. But people often used to say with permanence, oh my God, I hate the smell of perms. You don't hate the smell of permanence. Your hair. When you put an H on there, your hair stinks like rotten eggs. And they are never going to be able to do a permit without making your hair smell like rotten eggs. 
I'm sorry about that, okay? But a lot of times you're like, well, these chemicals smell horrible. No, it's your hair, okay? So then, what do you do? Then you either, step two, curl or straighten. Depending on what they want you to do with your hair that year and what you've been reading, you either curl or straighten your hair. So you take this person who has straight hair, you break all these bonds and make it smell, and you curl it up, and then you can guess what step three is. You add a chemical to reform the bond. So you're going to reform the sulfur-sulfur bridge, but now you're reforming it when the hair is inside of a curler. So it's not really permanent, but it definitely will last a pretty long time. People used to use, uh, you know, because I always wonder about where hair is going and basically the year we're at night now when I'm making this video. Um, we have gone through the 1960s and the 70s for women and men's hair. Uh, if you look at 1970s pictures, the men's hair looks a lot like it did. And we've gone through the outfits. We've gone through skinny suits and all that kind of stuff. And since we're redoing time, I keep thinking, and who knows, maybe by the time you watch this video, it's going to happen. Uh, we got to go through the 1980s with the hairspray again. And that was so much work for my wife. She had to like, she had very straight hair. She had to spray and tease it and all kinds of stuff to get these big styles. Um, but I, maybe people are afraid of going. Maybe they're going to skip the 19. Uh, um, whatever year that is. But for me, that's enough of what's in your house, and that takes care of this video on what's in your house, household chemicals. I hope you enjoy it. As I sigh too often.